Good morning. Hello again. We're gonna we're gonna get back started, and uh, I'm very very pleased to present uh, Professor Shaner, who's going to be moderating uh, this illustrious panel of the current members of the National Labor Relations Board. Many years ago, when I was a law student, law students tended to understand that the Wagner Act saved capitalism from its uh, excesses and that uh, uh, it grew out of the Great Depression and the uh, turmoil uh, of those years. Uh, today, I think law students have lost sight of some of that history. They've lost sight of how labor law and the traditional labor law framework uh, was so essential to, uh, to the uh, development of the workplace in America as they now focus on individual rights in the workplace, what we now call employment law. Um, you know, I was lucky as a law student after my 1L year to work in New York City with a man named Murray Gordon who represented policemen, firemen, um, interns and residents at city hospitals, and it introduced me to this area of law as a vibrant, uh, very vibrant field. Um, we are wonderfully blessed today to have the entire National Labor Relations Board uh, and the General Counsel, the six people in the country most involved in implementing uh, the National Labor Relations Act framework uh, with us. Um, we are also remarkably lucky that this is a board that takes its job very seriously and general counsel for that matter, um, so seriously that uh, uh, I would call it a remarkable time for the National Labor Relations Board. It has injected a, uh, a new uh, activism, if you will, into the field. Uh, it has revived the labor law practices of uh, senior lawyers for management who uh, uh, we're seeing that the field was not a good way to make a living, and now they're able to charge full rates and sometimes more uh, for dealing with labor management issues. Uh, uh, all that, uh, of course, has its pluses and minuses, depending on whose uh, spectacles you're using to look at things. The Labor Board has always had a political component, Democrats and Republicans with balance uh, on the board by tradition, if not by statute. Um, oftentimes see labor relations issues uh, differently. Uh, one man's bias and ignorance is another man's uh, even-handedness and enlightenment. Uh, and you flip the glasses around and, and that's just the way the world looks. So um, at any rate, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to say about the relationship with the board, uh, between the board and the courts, uh, just to kind of illustrate what several of the academic uh, panelists talked about. I argued a case before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals when um, I was working with Paul Hastings, Janowski, and Walker a number of years ago, and I arrived at the uh, uh, 11th Circuit a little bit early to hear the argument before mine. The argument before mine involved the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, counsel for the board had flown down from Washington and the senior judge on the panel was an icon of my life, uh, Frank Johnson. And Judge Johnson, uh, be when the labor board uh, lawyer stood up, said, counsel, does the board still adhere to its doctrine of non-acquiescence in decisions made by courts of appeals? only acquiescing to Supreme Court decisions. As he had to, counsel said yes. And Frank Johnson said, we understand, counsel, you may sit down. Uh, we needn't hear your argument. <laughs> so that is, that is my story about tension between courts and, uh, and the labor board. Uh, it happens. Well, here's our program in a nutshell. We're going to lead off. Um, with uh, the general counsel of the board. Uh, general counsel Griffin is going to talk about issues related to wage stagnation 
inequality in the workplace and the role of the labor board uh, and the general counsel. Uh, then we're going to follow up. Uh, part two is going to be with uh, Chair Pierce and member Ms. Kamara, who are going to talk about the new representation rule. Uh, uh, as you know, that's been a, a particularly interesting piece of what the board has done recently. Uh, thirdly, we're going to look to uh, member McFerrin to talk about the relationship between Congress uh, and the board because she has served now uh, in both institutions uh, and has not yet moved to a mental institution. Uh, she, is, uh, she has been central to both enterprises here. Um, fourth, we're going to uh, have member Hirazawa talk to us about some recent decisions focusing on recent decisions of substantial importance in the workplace. And lastly, uh, Member Johnson will talk to us about some pending issues uh, that many of you may know about and many of you probably don't. Uh, and at the end of the day, if I can keep the time moving on reasonably uh, on schedule, we'll have some questions and answers. So uh, let me introduce, I, I'm going to introduce each of these people uh, uh, individually rather than collectively, because I think if I do them all collectively, then uh, you'll lose your memory of who's who. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, anyway, Richard Griffin um, has a long, deep history of involvement with labor relations law, uh, serving for 28 years uh, as a lawyer and ultimately general counsel for the International Union of Operating Engineers. He's had uh, leadership positions uh, uh, on the uh, uh, IUOE's uh, pension fund. He was uh, uh, very much involved in uh, AFL-CIO uh, leadership. He has served not only as general counsel, his current position, but uh, unlike most general counsels, he's also served on the labor board, so he's seen the institution uh, from both perspectives. He's a, a graduate of Yale University with a JD from Northeastern, and so without further ado, uh, Mr. Griffin. And I understand these folks plan to remain seated, not use the podium, so uh, proceed. Thank you very much for, can everybody hear me? Is this mic, okay, good. Um, Thanks first to, uh, I'm going to join with everyone else who's spoken in thanking Emory for sponsoring this and for thanking the Emory Law Journal. And uh, it was really a wonderful experience to sit in the audience and listen uh, to the first panel uh, give, the, give their presentations. And I was extremely tempted, based on a number of the points that were raised, to kind of ditch my prepared remarks and uh, and respond sort of seriatim to a number of the points that were made. But then I decided that that would be inappropriate and I needed to exercise some discipline. <laughs> However, the most recent remark concerning non-acquiescence is making me modify my <laughs> position <laughs> slightly because for those of you who don't know, the general counsel in addition to, it's, it's a very interesting job, in addition to being the chief prosecutor of the unfair labor practices under the National Labor Relations Act. So there are 24,000 charges filed last year in the regional offices, and the regional offices act on behalf of the general counsel in determining merit and pursuing complaints in those unfair labor practices. Once the uh, board decides a case, it is the general counsel's obligation and duty to defend the board's position in the courts of appeals. And so the people who are the cannon fodder in front of the courts of appeals in the non-acquiescence context actually are a division of the Office of General Counsel, the appellate and Supreme Court litigation branch. Um, in this regard, there is a document that I don't have with me, but I'm going to forward for purposes of distribution to the attendees at this conference, which is a very remarkable document. It's about uh, 15 or 18 years old. And it's a response by the then acting solicitor of the board, a fellow named Jeff Wiedekind, who is now an, one of our most distinguished administrative law judges, uh, to the Fourth Circuit and to then Judge Luttig of the Fourth Circuit, who wanted an explanation in writing from the board of the non-acquiescence doctrine. And so uh, there is a remarkable uh, recitation 
in that response uh, that that uh, acting solicitor Wiedekind signed of the number of occasions where it took a number of years for the board to develop a conflict, for the conflict to get to the Supreme Court, and where the Supreme Court upheld the board's position, even in the face occasionally of unanimous uh, Circuit Court of Appeals disagreement with the board's position. And it goes into the reasons for non-acquiescence. It goes into many, many, many examples of uh, situations where courts of appeals have acknowledged the reasons for the board's non-acquiescence doctrine. And it cites example after example after example where the Supreme Court ultimately agreed with the position of the board. And I'm fully confident that that's what's going to happen with respect to the Horton Murphy oil situation, but that's a discussion for another day. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, and, and this comes up in the context of sort of here we are at the 80th anniversary of the, of the National Labor Relations Act, what is the continuing relevance of the agency, what is the continuing relevance of the work that is done by the 1,600 people who represent the agency out in the field uh, and in headquarters. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I consider to be, and I think it's fair to say, the sort of pressing domestic policy issue of the day, and that is uh, stagnant wages and increasing income inequality, um, and, uh, and where the board is with respect to those two issues. As has been pointed out, um, we're a, a, not an agency that has any independent investigatory authority. We're uh, dependent on charges being filed. And, uh, and in response to, uh, to th that uh, pressing domestic policy issue, there are uh, movements of workers and employees that are trying to do something about that. Um, and in one instance, uh, uh, you may be familiar that there is a move afoot uh, at the Walmart Corporation uh, there is an organization called Our Walmart that is agitating for changing the terms and conditions of employment at Walmart. That's agitating for higher wages, uh, uh, more regular hours, and things like that. And so um, when I became the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, I was confirmed, uh, notably under the old rules, incidentally, when it was still 60 votes for cloture and I got 62, thereby earning my nickname of landslide. <laughs> and, and, and I got 55 votes for confirmation. It was bipartisan support. I had 54 Democrats and Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. Um, uh, I, took, I was confirmed in late October of, 19, of excuse me, 2013, and I took office. My commission was signed. I was sworn in. November 4th of 2013. And the job of the general counsel, I had previously worked at the board. I had started my career as, as, as counsel for board member uh, John Fanning, who was the longest serving board member in the history of the board, served from 1956 until 1982. And then uh, our staff, when Mr. Fanning wasn't reappointed by President Reagan, I went to work for Chairman Donald Dotson. Um, uh, and worked for him for a little while before I left to go, as was mentioned, to work for the operating engineers. Um, and so I knew about the board from that status, and I had been a constitutionally challenged recess-appointed board member. Um, I'm one of the two board members whose status was decided in the Noel Canning case. Um, but in any event, uh, I had not really grasped the full extent of the, of the general counsel's job. Uh, and when I got in it and started, I immediately realized I needed a lot of help. And so I started having meetings the first day with the various division heads. And the first person who I met with was Barry Carney, who some of you may know, who is the longtime head of the Division of Advice. And the Division of Advice is the division that uh, assist the regions with particularly difficult cases or momentous cases. And Barry said to me, there's a whole bunch of charges against Walmart that have been pending for a long time, and you got to do something about them because of Black Friday. Now, I confess right now, I am not a shopper. 
Um, and I didn't know what he was talking about when he said Black Friday. And I'm, I'm not kidding around. I was literally ignorant of what Black Friday was, okay? So I didn't really focus on it. And then he came back into my office a couple of days later, and he says, you got to do something on these Walmart cases because of Black Friday. And finally, not wanting to admit my ignorance but having no other choice, I said, what do you, what, what do you mean Black Friday? He said, it's the day after Thanksgiving when there's all this shopping, and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that happens this time because all these charges relate to the preceding Black Friday when uh, our Walmart and others took a series of actions and Walmart uh, reacted and uh, allegedly, pursuant to some charges that were filed, committed some unfair labor practices. So I said, oh, now I understand because... This was by November 8th, and, you know, if we were going to do something and give some guidance, we had to act very fast. So um, on November 18th, which was about 10 days later, uh, there was a press release that was issued um, by my office, and that press release announced that a determination had been made to issue uh, complaints against Walmart in a or to find merit, excuse me, to find merit with the number of charges with respect to Walmart and in other instances to find no merit. And it was just sort of a plain vanilla summary of what the things were. And there was a period of time that uh, resulted in uh, attempts to settle and resolve those cases. And, and in January, uh, we ended up issuing a complaint. And I'm just going to read from uh, this complaint, and then I'm going to tell you where the cases are right now so you understand uh, or my point is that um, in this uh, sort of crucial uh, effort that's going on uh, nationally with respect to Walmart that the board is um, processing charges issuing complaints and litigating cases with respect to unfair labor practices so uh, the complaint that was issued which was a consolidated complaint uh, alleged as follows. During two national television news broadcasts and in statements to employees at Walmart stores in California and Texas, Walmart unlawfully threatened employees with reprisal if they engaged in strikes and protests. At stores in California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Ohio, Texas, and Washington, Walmart unlawfully threatened, disciplined, and or terminated employees for having engaged in legally protected strikes and protests. At stores in California, Florida, and Texas, Walmart unlawfully threatened, surveilled, disciplined, and or terminated employees in anticipation of or in response to employees' other protected concerted activities. Now, this case presented uh, a little bit of a lo logistical challenge because, as you can see, um, that's a lot of places. This is a national uh, uh, situation, and so what we ended up doing was we bifurcated the, the, the litigation into what we call the national issues and the local issues. There is one judge. There is a consolidated national complaint. What he's doing is he's going around the country, and he's trying, opening the record on the national issue, and then he's closing the record in that particular location on the national issues, then he's opening the record on the local issues, tr trying those, and then proceeding on. And so just as an update on where it stands right now, we started with 60 alleged discriminatees in 14 different states. Uh, so far, we have tried 16 of the 18 discharges that were involved. Uh, there have been convened national hearings in Oakland, Fort Worth, New Orleans, Seattle, Los Angeles and Miami. The local trial in Oakland was concluded. There is an ALJ uh, decision in that trial. All of the allegation, unfair labor practice allegations that were uh, put forward in the complaint were upheld by the ALJ with one exception, which was a surveillance exception. So far, uh, we've had 28 days of hearing, uh, over 5,600 pages of transcript, joint exhibits that number 1,321, uh, general counsel exhibits of 123, employer exhibits of 259, units exhibits of 15. Walmart has produced over 250,000 documents that are in a uh, electronic database that we have access to through the Justice Department called Relativity, 
relativity, and the trial team is routinely pulling things out of that database for use in these trials. So um, my point here is not to tell too much of a war story. It's just to say that to the extent that there is a crucial uh, nationally important labor dispute going on, the Labor Board is in the middle of uh, determining uh, pursuing unfair labor practice cases, having adjudications over the merits of those unfair labor practices, and I think that demonstrates, at least in this particular area, a certain amount of continuing relevance. Uh, I will make this point in one other way, and that is one that I'm sure no one in this room has heard anything about, and that has to do with the consolidated complaint that has been issued against McDonald's. Uh, there is a, similarly a national campaign going on uh, seeking to raise uh, uh, fast food workers' wages to $15 an hour and to address a number of other uh, matters. In that area, uh, one of the targets of that campaign has been McDonald's. Um, uh, when I became the general counsel, there were a couple of hundred unfair labor practice charges that were, had been filed against McDonald's, and the charging parties had named not just the McDonald's franchisees, but had also in a number of instances uh, named McDonald's corporate, the franchisor, as a joint employer. And uh, to make a long story short, ultimately after a lot of back and forth and having the parties in to discuss these matters, uh, merit uh, determinations were made with respect to a number of these cases, uh, and uh, in those cases where merit was found, uh, we also alleged that McDonald's, the corporate employer, the franchisor, is a joint employer with the franchisees. Um, that case involves a number of consolidated complaints from around the country. The trial uh, opened with some motions practice at the end of March. Uh, and uh, the, the actual testimony is likely to commence in, in uh, May. Uh, the theory that is being advanced by the general counsel in this case with respect to the joint employer status is based on initially the current state of the law. Uh, we, I have been asked on, I think, four separate occasions by congressional oversight committees uh, what the theory that's being advanced is and have responded in each instance that the theory that's being advanced is that we can prove joint employer status under the current state of the law. We are also arguing in the alternative that, uh, that under a test we have proposed to the board in a case where the board sought briefing on the joint employer issue, a case called Browning-Ferris, where we argue that the board should return to its old traditional joint employer standard, that we can make out joint employer status under that uh, standard as well. But we are not proceeding in either McDonald's or in any other case where there's an outstanding complaint against anyone on a joint employer theory solely on the theory that was advanced in the Browning Ferris amicus brief that we, we filed advocating for a different uh, joint employer standard. And just so uh, we're clear about that, we're also joined in that regard by the EEOC, which also filed a uh, brief in the Browning Ferris case arguing uh, that the board's current joint employer standard is not consistent with the joint employer standard that the EEOC applies or that applies in uh, Title VII cases and that the board should uh, revise its standard to be in compliance with uh, other labor laws. Uh, so the McDonald's case is, is a very high profile matter. Um, the uh, International Franchise Association and other groups are concerned that uh, the theory that's being advanced uh, will do damage to the uh, franchise model, which is a very important uh, part of the economic, which has generated an enormous amount of uh, economic growth and job opportunities. And um, my response to that is um, in the Browning Ferris brief, we were very clear that there are cases that established under the board's old standard that we're asking them to return to, that if a franchisor and a franchisee's relationship 
involved a situation where the franchisor was indirectly affecting terms and conditions of employment of the franchisee employees in order to protect the uniformity and the quality of its brand or product, the board had held in these old cases, that doesn't amount to joint employer status. And in the Browning-Ferris brief, we have specifically said, and I have specifically said in response to all these congressional oversight in inquiries, that we are not seeking to overturn those cases. So if the franchisor-franchisee relationship is focused on protecting the uniformity of the brand or product, that doesn't uh, give rise to us wanting to seek joint employer status. But there are situations where the franchisor goes well beyond that, w gets involved in determining or co-determining terms and conditions of employment in a way that goes beyond protecting the uniformity of the brand or product. And those are the cases where we're looking, uh, if the charges are brought, if the joint employer status is asserted, uh, we're looking to proceed uh, on the joint employer theory with respect to those employers. So those are two examples where I think um, what we're up to uh, demonstrates uh, that uh, the, the Labor Board still has a uh, very, uh, very important role to play with respect to crucial uh, issues uh, in, the, in the American workplace. Uh, I'm going to conclude because I just got the high sign, uh, and, I, and, I, and I really want to hear what my, uh, the colleagues on the board have to say, and I want to make sure you get an opportunity to hear it, by just telling one story that I think um, epitomizes why I am so proud to be uh, and humbled to be uh, in this job and to be working with the people who do this work for the National Labor Relations Board around the country. We had a case in Ohio, in Cleveland, that involved an organizing campaign in a hospital where there were the nurses in the hospital were trying to organize. And uh, the employer's response involved a number of, of uh, alleged unfair labor practices, including firing a long-term nurse who was the lead organizer. And uh, we have available to us and uh, former Chairman Gould mentioned uh, this section of the Act and his remarks, Section 10J, which allows uh, for the Board to seek interim injunctive relief in the federal district courts where there is a possibility that if we wait for the Board's administrative process to take place, uh, there will be remedial failure. There will be some irreparable harm that can't be addressed by the ultimate Board order. And so, uh, we have a, a, a very active 10-J program, which if I had more time, I would spend some, some time discussing. But in this instance, what we did uh, was the general kind. There was a decision to issue a complaint by the regional director in Cleveland. Uh, authorization was sought uh, for 10-J relief. The board approved seeking 10-J relief and a successful uh, a request for an injunction was uh, was uh, litigated with the federal district court. And part of the remedy that was awarded was a notice reading. And this was a very organized group of nurses, and they showed up and made kind of a ceremony at the point where the notice was read in the workplace. And uh, the woman who read the notice was the lead attorney uh, in the board case. And the person who was discharged her husband came up to the, uh, to the lead attorney right after she read the notice. And, she sa and the husband said, you know, I got cancer right when my wife was fired. And therefore, I was not able to be there for her during this bad time when she was fired. And I want to thank you so much for being there for my wife during this very difficult time. And I'm and you can tell I'm getting emotional again. <laughs> Every time I tell this story, I get emotional. Um, that's the kind of work that's being done around the country by representatives of the National Labor Relations Board, and I would uh, submit that that still continues to be extremely important uh, and relevant work. It is certainly very important and very relevant work, and the next two uh, presenters are going to talk about uh, uh, a very wide-ranging and uh, 
interesting development at the Labor Board, which, uh, which has to do with uh, the uh, uh, rules concerning representation. Uh, Mark Pierce is the chair of the uh, National Labor Relations Board. He was a founding partner of a Buffalo uh, law firm that practiced on the union and employee side. Um, he uh, uh, worked with the National Labor Re Relations uh, Board as a junior attorney many years ago. Uh, he has taught at Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations uh, Extension. Uh, he's a fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. Um, very long-term, again, involvement with the uh, field of labor and employment law. Uh, and our second presenter, they're going to do this as a package uh, concerning the representation rules, uh, is Philip Miskamara, who uh, came to the Labor Board after a number of years with uh, Morgan Lewis and Bacchius and uh, management side practice with several other firms, including Safer Shaw, uh, Ogletree Deacons, um, and so on. And, and he has authored a number of books concerning labor law issues, uh, including one involving the NLRB and managerial discretion and NLRB and secondary boycotts. Uh, so I will turn it over without ado to uh, 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 Chairman Pierce and uh, Member Ms. Kamara. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I would, before I start out, I'd like to uh, greet everybody and, and, and uh, recognize one thing. Our general counsel has been doing pretty marvelous work, and you can see from his presentation his commitment to the mission and purpose of the act. There's one thing that um, he could say that, that illustrates how strong the pulse is of the National Labor Relations Board. Fiscal year 2014, $44 million in, in back pay uh, uh, awarded and uh, just under 3,000 uh, unlawfully terminated people put back to work. So for the little agency that could, um, we're still doing a little bit of work here. Uh, I'd like to thank Professor Shaner and uh, Professor Green for, for uh, their, their invitation and assistance in, the, in, in this regard, um, and of course the sponsoring law firm of uh, Ford and Harrison, and I'd like to congratulate you in your l lawsuit against that uh, actor in Star Wars who stole your name. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, <laughs> I had I had the opportunity to to to, to chat with two two of the par partners last night. Of, of the firm, and we had a, a very scintillating conversation despite the alcohol. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we talked about the, uh, the, the importance of having co uh, programs like this and how, how great these kind of programs are. And I told, told them that I, I agreed and, and, and that uh, I related to them my, my conversation with Professor, Professor Green uh, uh, a year prior where, where he talked about trying to put something like this together. And I said, well, you know, this is the 80th anniversary of this nation's labor law, and it, it has its basis of recognition throughout the country. And despite these notions of, of, of uh, it being cabined in particular sections of the, co the country, uh, I felt and I think my colleagues agreed that it would be important that we acknowledge that we kick this off by appearing here in the South. And uh, we're very glad to be here and we appreciate the invitation. <laughs> now, uh, the final rule amending the representation case handling procedure of the NLRB was published in December 15, 2014, and will be effective April 14, 2015. Uh, Phil Miskamara and I will give a brief commentary on the rule uh, from the perspective of majority and dissent. We already had our fisticuffs behind closed doors, so we will be very <laughs> polite. Uh, 
Uh, by way of background, this final rule marks the completion of a long delayed project of examining and revising its procedural rules for representation cases. While there were efforts in this regard in 2011, this is a more comprehensive statement that was produced with the participation of a full five-member board. At every stage of the rules development, the board's work has been marked by full and earnest engagement of each of the board's members and the frank and open exchange of ideas among them. Additionally, the input from the detailed and insightful commentary from the public has resulted in the production of a remarkably thorough and thoughtfully considered amendments to, to the representation procedure. A aspect of the amendments are summarized uh, as follows. The final rule was designed to update and modernize representation case procedures, address some inefficiencies and inconsistencies in the way in which we process these cases, and generally increase transparency by providing earlier and more complete information to parties and prospective voters to the election. And we're not just talking about unions and employers, we're also talking about petitioners who might be filing decertification petitions and the like. Modernizing includes electronic uh, filing of petitions and other documents consistent with contemporary litigation practice. The rule updates the 50-year-old voter list disclosure requirement. The Excelsior list will, to the extent that the employer has the information, include personal contact information most commonly utilized in this day and age, i.e. personal email addresses and phone numbers of the voters. It streamlines the process uh, by reducing and eliminating unnecessary litigation and delay. For example, hearings, eligibility issues uh, will in the discretion of the reg regional director be addressed post-election where it only affects a small percentage of the unit employees. And depending on the results of the election, that issue may be rendered moot. Uh, requests for reviews of re uh, uh, regional director decisions can be made before or after the election, uh, also leaving the possibility that the election results may render that question moot. The elimination of the 25-day automatic stay of an election. That, that occurs after the regional director issues a decision. Parties may still request that an election be stayed by in, a, in the particular circumstances of their case, and the regional director of the board may stay in election if appropriate. The enhancement of transparency. Voters and parties will receive early and more detailed information about the filing of the petition, including how the petition was processed, their rights and obligations, the voter process, and issues in dispute. The pre-hearing statement of position. This form will narrow the issues to be litigated at the representation hearing and avoid surprise and delay. Consistency and uniformity. Now, practitioners will attest that depending on the region, you see a different uh, set of local standards and practices relative to representation uh, processes. Under the final rule, parties will be able to argue orally in support of their positions at the close of a pre-election hearing. That means post-hearing briefs will be allowed only if the regional director determines that they are necessary, consistent with the briefing practices we now follow in post-election hearings for example, objections and challenges hearings. Appeals to the board of the regional director's post-election rulings will be at the board's discretion, just like pre-election RD decisions are now. Representation hearings will be eight days after the filing of the petition, unless the, 
the regional director is uh, presented with a case with complex issues or special or extraordinary circumstances have been shown. This is much, not much different than the 7 to 14 days that is currently in effect at <coughs> in different regions around the country, except now you have some consistency. In the event of a blocking charge, the final rule requires that an offer of proof be submitted with that charge and that the charging party make its witnesses available promptly which will help expedite the investigation and prevent meritless or abusive charges from unnecessarily blocking an election. The reaction to the final rule. The rule was uh, praised by Richard Trumka, president of the AFL-CIO, as one of the NLRB's modest but important reforms to the representation election process. He noted too often lengthy and unnecessary litigation over minor issues bogged down the election process and prevents workers from getting the vote they want. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce's reaction was more succinct. <laughs> they sued us, uh, as did a few other business organizations in D.C. and in the Fifth Circuit, respectively. Uh, asserting, among, among other things, that the board's rule changes conflict with the NLRA by striving for quickie elections. I, I hadn't heard that term before. Uh, which would result in curtailment of robust debate and free speech. A resolution of disapproval, as, as was mentioned, was passed in both houses of Congress under the Congressional Review Act, which um, if put into effect, absent a veto of the president, would prevent the rule from taking effect. President Obama on March 3rd, 31st, 2015, uh, exercising only his fourth veto since his presidency, signed a memorandum of disapproval of the resolution. Now, my observations in this regard is, is such, the final rule is a great achievement. It differs from the proposed rule uh, contained in the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking that we issued in many ways, both large and small, and in virtually every key aspect of the rule. Most of these departures from the original proposal were prompted by criticisms and concerns raised by our dissenting colleagues, as well as the public comments. The rule has been greatly improved as a result. While, these, while there was agreement among all the board that the representation procedures relating to the board's core functions, uh, rather they, they relate to the board's core functions, we disagreed on how it could be improved. The majority sought to address discrete problems with targeted solutions while maintaining the essential elements of the existing process. Much of the dissent, by contrast, focuses on the timeline for pet from petition to election and the possible effect of each amendment on that timeline. Indeed, the dissent proposed the creation of a mandatory timeline for scheduling of elections. A mandatory timeline is somewhat, something that over the nearly 80 years of the Act's existence, both Congress and the Board has declined to to uh, set. Because of the commonly diverse bargaining unit characteristics and circumstances that define the American workforce, we declined to do so as well. The view that the elections should be scheduled for the earliest date practicable is the standard that predates these amendments and the standard that should remain. It provides the regional directors with the appropriate discretion, and it is reflected in the current case handling manual and similar manuals dating back to the 70s. We wish that the board could have been unanimous as to every amendment contained in the final rule. We accept that given the broad range of differing experiences and the viewpoints represented on the board, 
even with our best efforts, a full consensus as to every issue was not likely to be achieved. It is, however, noteworthy that all board members agree that our representation procedures are important, and they agree on many objectives underlying the rule. And as Phil will point out, there are many common views. Even more importantly, the deliberations, discussions, and exchanges of ideas among board members have proved the value of having a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds of the board. In conclusion, I believe that the final rule was accomplished, has accomplished the long-delayed objective of the board to modern, modernize, simplify, and clarify the representation case process. Uh, and it's to the benefit of all parties. With these changes, the board strives to ensure that its representation process remains a model of fairness and efficiency for all. I'll turn this over to Phil now. Um, it, it's also great being here. and. Uh, I was struck when Professor Shainer indicated that Mark and I would be presenting some comments about our representation rule as a package. I thought, how appropriate, <laughs> considering that that's how we were confirmed, <laughs> <laughs> along with uh, Member Johnson and Member Hirazawa. And uh, to complete the picture, um, Member McFerrin was significantly involved in our confirmation, since at the time she was played a very important role on the Senate Labor Committee. So. Uh, it's, it's ha I'm happy to be here in, in many different respects. Uh, with respect to the final representation rule, um, I'll just make one point. Um, and uh, Mark and I agreed that we would not go um, issue by issue through the rule, uh, which is probably a good thing since the original version when it was released was 733 pages long. Um, <laughs> I recommend that everyone actually start on page 494, which is where the <laughs> dissenting views start that were expressed by Member Johnson and myself. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just really comment on one particular issue, um, which is when you read through the rule, um, I agree with Mark that there are many views that all of the participating members, all five of us, had in common in going through the rule. The rule did not want for any uh, lack of attention within the board. There's a reason for that. It's very, our representation procedures are very, very important, and uh, all of the board members think that. Uh, when you go through the various uh, opinions that are expressed in the final rule, uh, you'll see that um, all of the board members unanimously uh, think our representation election should be as effective as possible. All of the board members oppose uh, lengthy delays from the time that a petition is filed until the time that an election occurs. Uh, Member Johnson and I express support for having most elections occur between 30 and 35 days after a petition is filed. Uh, we express support in making whatever changes would be necessary in our own internal procedures so that nearly every election could take place no more than 60 days after uh, the boards, uh, after a, uh, an election petition is filed. And so uh, the thought might occur to many people with, with those types of views that are in common across all five board members that participated in, in the representation rule, why was it that we were unable to forge a consensus around a path that would have had unanimous support uh, across the board. And as Member Johnson and I expressed in our dissenting views, had we been able to achieve a unanimous rule, uh, we anticipate it would also have had substantial support among most employers and most unions and most advocates for employees. Um, but I would identify four areas that help explain why, in spite of our efforts across the board and lots of attention we gave to the rule, why we were unable to forge a consensus path that would have had unanimous support. Um, one area which Mark has already alluded to is the 
The bulk in the expanse of the rule itself represented a significant area of disagreement. And, um, you know, affectionately, Member Johnson and I refer to the rules, the Mount Everest of regulations, you know, massive in scale, unforgiving in its effect. But um, I'm not sure that anybody can fully anticipate how the expanse of the changes addressed in the final rule will actually play out in practice. And, 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 and the expanse alone, the bulk alone associated with the rule, increased the difficulty of uh, coming to terms across the board on all of the various moving parts. The second area is we, we really had a fundamental disagreement about how much room our statute left for the board to make a number of the changes. Um, you know, one of the principal objectives underlying the majority's approach was to eliminate unnecessary litigation. All five board members, by the way, oppose any manipulation of the board's processes by one party or the other for an unfair advantage. But at two different times in the Act's uh, in the Act's history, Congress contemplated the possibility of having some elections occur before the uh, election-related hearing would take place. And two different times, Congress, uh, both in 1947 and 1959, rejected squarely the possibility of having elections take place without a pre-election hearing. The final rule significantly cuts back on the scope of the pre-election hearing in ways that uh, Member Johnson and I at least thought has pretty much been addressed by Congress with respect to the necessary elements of the pre-election hearing. Uh, the th third area that I would identify is um, we, we had some fundamental disagreements about changes that uh, we thought and think are likely to be very difficult for our agency to administer in representation elections, or in some respects uh, would cause fundamental unfairness to uh, one side or the other, or to the employees whose interests are uh, in the balance in our representation election cases. And the uh, fourth area, and, and the one that I think was kind of most fundamental in our deliberations regarding the rule deals with whether the board should actually directly provide guidance on this question of speed. And as Mark indicated, the central focus of the rule is for elections to take place as soon as practicable after a petition is filed. And um, even if one applies that standard, um, uh, Member Johnson and I thought it makes sense to um, ask, well, how long is too long and how short is too short in terms of the time for campaigning, the time for parties to exercise their right to engage in protected speech? The board, at least throughout its recent history, has had a target that's been applied with consistency in terms of the amount of time that at least the agency has focused on, which has been 42 days. And um, we thought that it would be helpful and important for the board to address this speed issue directly. And if so, uh, that would have permitted, we thought, uh, and think the other procedural changes to then be addressed on their own merits. Um, but uh, the one point I'll make just in closing is uh, you know, the rule is a procedural rule dealing with some uh, pr the process by which our representation elections are conducted. The statute has not changed, and we're still applying, all five of us, the same act. Uh, the full board still has the same responsibility in our representation elections, which is to decide uh, election-related issues as a full board in a way that gives effect to what Congress put together when it charged uh, charged the board with the responsibility to conduct representation elections. Uh, all five of us fully support that mission, and that's something we're going to continue to address uh, prospectively as a full board in future representation election cases. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. 
we have talked here uh, on the panels today about the relationship between the courts and the National Labor Relations Board. We have talked about the general counsel's role. We have talked about representation rules. And, and uh, what we haven't yet addressed um, is the issue of the relationship, at least not in great depth, the relationship of the agency to Congress. And uh, the newest member of the board, sworn in December 17, 2014, uh, Lauren McFerrin, is the perfect person to talk about uh, those issues. Um, she is a graduate from my alma mater, Rice University, and then went to one of my favorite law schools, uh, Yale, because my older daughter uh, went there, still is there, actually. And uh, anyway, Lauren uh, served as Chief Labor Counsel for the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Um, and she worked extensively with uh, senior labor, uh, well, uh, with Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, for whom she served as senior labor, labor counsel, and with Senator Tom Harkin. Um, early, before that, she was a labor lawyer at Bredhoff and Kaiser, one of the preeminent labor law firms in the country, and uh, clerked for Judge uh, uh, Carolyn uh, King on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. So. Uh, uh, Thank you, Member McFerrin, for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. And I wanted to um, extend my thanks as well to the folks at Emory and the students who put this together for hosting this important symposium. Um, this is actually one of the first of these panels that I have done, so you'll have to forgive my inexperience. I'm used to sitting in back of important people and handing them note cards when they say things that are wrong. <laughs> it will happen at some point when she hands me I a note card. I got three card, note cards me. during my comments. <laughs> but even from the back row, for the last 10 years, I've had a front row seat at a football game where the NLRB has been the football. <laughs> and um, so I've been asked to speak um, about um, some, some of that experience. Um, why is the board such a political football? Well, some of it comes back to, I think, basic political science. When we all started, as many of us in the room were probably political science majors, once we discovered that we couldn't do math and wouldn't go to med school. <laughs> So we write a book called The Logic of Collective Action that says that when you have an issue that a few people care about a whole lot, and then you have another issue that a lot of people care about but not really all that strongly, the political system is going to give attention to the issue that a few people care about a whole lot. And the thing about the board and its issues is that there's on both sides of the debate, there's a circumscribed population of people who care about it very, very much. And that's an issue that is designed to get heightened political attention. Um, there are key political constituencies for both major parties for whom the NLRB's issues are litmus test issues. Um, when I was working on the Hill, I actually had a representative of one of the major business trade associations thank me for my work on the Employee Free Choice Act because he said it was the best fundraising tool that they'd ever had. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that someone on the other side might have said the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge that we face on, in the legislative branch with the National Labor Relations Act is that as a practical matter, we, as a political matter, we can't touch the statute itself. Um, there's in a divided, very partisan atmosphere like the Hill is right now, there's two ways that you can actually get legislation accomplished. I give, give great credit to my former bosses, both Senator Kennedy and Senator Harkin, in that they passed an ex incredible amount of important legislation in a bipartisan manner in a very tense political environment. But there's basically two ways that you do that. You can either compromise or you can horse trade. Um, you can say, look, you know, in the, on this education bill, the states, we think the states should have 90% of the money and the federal government should have 10. No, we think that it should be 90% the other way and 10 the other way. And so you compromise on 50-50 and that bill passes. Or you have a pensions bill where the Boy Scouts need a pensions fix and the rural electric co-ops need a pensions fix. And so, well, then you have a bill, um, some, something one side wants and something the other side wants. Uh, the problem with the National Labor Relations Act is in the current very hyper-partisan political environment, you've got two sides that don't necessarily agree on the goal. So um, it's very hard to actually do the work that we're supposed to be doing, which is legislating. You can sit in a room and say, I think that workers should have X, Y, and Z rights. And somebody on the other side of the table says, I don't think they should. And you're kind of done with the conversation. So as a result, the 
NLRA issues tend to play out in what I consider to be the biggest arenas of political theater. That is the confirmation process, um, oversight, appropriations riders, most recently the Congressional Review Act, and one of my personal favorites, meaningless budget amendments. We have this whole process on the Hill where we have tons and tons of amendments to the budget that are absolutely meaningless. Um, They create what's called reserve funds, where you're basically saying, if this budget were to pass, we could conceivably with this budget fund X, Y, or Z thing. And you get to the point where you start to be able to craft these things pretty creatively. So the Democrats could come, say, create a reserve fund so that every member of the National Labor Relations Board should get their salary doubled. And then the Republicans would come back and have a reserve fund so that we would all be dragged out and shot. And these would be the amendments that we would vote on, and it would be nice political theater. Um, But in that environment, the rhetoric just gets pretty extreme. Um, The National Labor Relations Act is either going to destroy American capitalism as we know it or single-handedly save the American middle class. And I have heard both arguments in many various forms. Um, So it was a little bit surprising to me in coming to the board how very much the environment is incredibly different and much, very much for the better um, and for the sake of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, I often joke with my Republican colleagues, they do not actually sit in their offices and throw darts at workers or things like that. <laughs> not even at pictures of workers. Um, the nice thing about the board is that we do agree on the goal. Uh, we don't necessarily agree on how to interpret the act, but we agree on the goal, which is that the National Labor Relations Act is important and we should be doing our very best job to do our job and interpret it faithfully and true to its intentions. Um, and we certainly can, we can do actual work. We do actual important work every day. So um, the environment is not at all like the discussion of these issues that I was familiar with on the Hill. We are extremely fortunate right now to have an extremely functional and collegial board that is dedicated to doing the business of the board. Um, We agree much, well, we do have significant disagreements, as as Phil pointed out. We agree much more often than you'd think in the routine cases um, where the greatest asset that our agency has are incredibly dedicated and talented career staff make sure that the day-to-day act, business of the act is getting done. Um, It is not about rhetoric is not about, it's about trying to find a way to get to yes. And usually when we can't get to yes, it's because of principled disagreements about how to interpret the statute. I don't think anybody sitting at this table, which like I said, might have been a surprise to me in my previous job, is in any way, shape or form outcome driven. Um, I I sometimes don't even know who the parties in the case are when I'm reading the issues. I, I don't pay attention to who the parties in the case are when I'm reading the issue because that's not my job. And um, I would have thought maybe on the Hill that, that, that that's what the board members did. Um, we do face really tough issues. Um, these are not, they're not easy issues, and I really have been impressed to watch all of these dedicated and thoughtful people grappling with issues that the framers of the National Labor Relations Act could never have contemplated involving social media, least employment relationships. These were, these were things that were not contemplated in the 1940s, and they're difficult and challenging issues. The one perhaps the most important lesson that I've learned and I would you know, kind of preach to all of you and I will preach to every crowd I get the opportunity to speak with is why it's so, it would be so, it's so important for the political process to let the board do its job. Um, mine was probably the smoothest transition for a new board member in decades. Um, we have had, I had, there were no recess appointments, there were no extended vacancies, there were no, um, you know, long periods of time where there was a gap in the seat, and we certainly you know, we didn't have to con- put, bring four new board members or three new board members or even two new board members on at a time. The statute was designed to have one new board member transition in at a time, and that makes for a very smooth transition where the board can keep doing its job. Because while I was certainly, and certainly am still, in a huge uphill battle of the learning curve of learning how to do this job, the agency is functioning beautifully. Um, you know, my my onboarding process has not slowed us down at all. And there's, you know, the, the business kept going. Nancy Schiffer walked out the door one day. I walked in the door the next day. I promptly killed all of her plants, and for that I apologize. <laughs> but it was a smooth transition, and the board was allowed to do its job. So I really hope that that can become the new normal for the board, um, that regardless of the nature of the issues that we work with, 
the agency, I hope, is allowed to do its job and that um, we're allowed to have these kind of more orderly transitions of power so that the basic operability of the board is never affected. Um, I think that's about all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your presentation because it mirrored so much my own experience as general counsel of EEOC where I would tell people I'm just enforcing the law and some people wouldn't like that. Um, and also uh, your notion of political theater I think was a very good political science uh, uh, encapsulation. Uh, my favorite political theory was where Congress suspended funding for three years for a rule that we had uh, had the temerity su to suggest, and then after three years of funding uh, holdups, they passed a statute that enacted our rule, basically, with a couple of little add-ons. So at any rate, uh, Washington is Washington, uh, so be it. Um, I am delighted to, uh, to present to you our next board member, uh, Kent Hirazawa, and uh, he is going to talk about uh, uh, issues related to uh, board decisions that are uh, uh, of substantial importance in the American workplace. Uh, uh, the board's work for everybody who knows it is divided largely into uh, matters that have to do with representation and matters that have to do with unfair labor practices. And I think he's going to focus on the unfair labor practice decisions uh, of the board recently. Um, Mr. Hirozawa served as chief counsel to NLRB member uh, uh, and current chair, um, Mark Pierce. Uh, for a while, he worked as a field attorney for many years uh, for the NLRB in Region 2. He clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, uh, practiced law with a New York City uh, labor law firm, uh, BA from Yale University, JD from NYU, and I'll turn it right over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shainer. Let me add my thanks to the editors and staff of the Emory Law Journal and Professor Michael Green for organizing this um, fabulous event. It's, um, I just have to say how much I've enjoyed uh, the program so far, and it is uh, a real honor to be on the same program with um, legends of the Labor Law Academy. Uh, Professor Getman, whose writings I've been reading for, for many decades and, and learned so much from, Professor San Antoine, um, also been, um, been benefiting from his work for many years, and I still have um, your casebook from <laughs> my basic labor law class. Um, I think that was many editions ago. Um, and of course, Professor Gould, who in addition to his um, contributions to the scholarship in the field, um, had a distinguished term as the uh, chair of the labor board at a, at a critical time. And I particularly appreciated Professor Garden's insightful analysis of the, of the board's most recent experience with rulemaking. I agree with all of your conclusions and um, both um, based on the, the excellent points that, that you make in your paper and, and also based on my own personal experience with, um, with rulemaking, especially the hundreds of hours spent in both iterations of the R case procedure rule. The, um, in the time that I, that I have, I, can, I can't really do more than scratch the surface of the, um, the many cases that the board has decided that are significant in some way or another. What, what I'll just do is, is um, point out several different areas in which um, I think that the, the board has done something significant. And I think that 
most of it has to do with um, the board catching up with changes in um, in the economy and um, and society um, over the the most recent period of the um, act's lengthy history. Perhaps the most significant decision um, in the board's um, most recent period, just in terms of how many how many employees and employers are affected, is the D.R. Horton decision, which the um, which the current board reaffirmed in the in the Murphy Oil case. Um, on the non-acquiescence question, I think I should add that I think the um, the best and most detailed treatment of the of the um, non-acquiescence doctrine that I'm familiar with is the um, article that was published in the Yale Law Journal by uh, Professor Sam Stryker, who's here and is on the afternoon panel, along with um, with um, Professor and former Dean of the law school, uh, Richard Revez. So to anyone who wants to um, learn more about that, I, I would um, commend that article to you. Other, um, wh when I say that these decisions respond to um, changes in employment practices, th there have been a lot of um, questions raised about why it took the board so long to get to this question. The act's been around since 1935, yet um, D.R. Horton wasn't published until January of 2012. And I think that um, ultimately the answer is pretty obvious. It's that in 1935, or even when, um, when I was working non-lawyer jobs, we didn't have these kinds of agreements being uh, being required of workers as a as a condition of employment. Meanwhile, if you look at the cases under D.R. Horton that we have pending for the board today, it's just any practically any kind of job that you could that you could imagine. Um, one of the uh, leading cases that are uh, that are pending is Domino's Pizza and I I don't think that 20 years ago there was any pizza shop that was requiring its employees to uh, to sign a uh, an arbitration agreement so I think that this is really just a matter of the board having to respond to to changes in the in the economy and society, we have um, similar kinds of issues being addressed in the in the cases that that talk about who is an employee for purposes of the act. Um, the most recent significant decision in that area, I think, would be the decision last year in FedEx home delivery addressing the independent contractor issue, um, an area in which um, the D.C. Circuit had asked the board to, to better explain its position. And of course, there are um, cases pending before the board um, that Harry will be talking about, like the uh, Browning-Ferris case in which the board has requested briefing from the public. The board has also been catching up with changes in communications technology. There was the decision last year in Purple Communications in which the board held that the, um, that as a general rule, absent special circumstances, an employer that gives its, ac its employees access to its email system can't prohibit the the use of of that system for
for um, for protected communications um, as long as they're done on non-working time. And I should um, I should say that it was um, that the board found very helpful in uh, in addressing that issue the um, article published by Professor Jeff Hirsch, who's also on this afternoon's panel, um, pointing out all the things that were wrong with the uh, with the board's register guard decision. Similarly, in Triple Play Sports Bar, the board addressed protected communications um, in the area of social media, and um, in that case, it involved employees who were um, who were disciplined for posts that they had um, that they had put on Facebook. There have also been cases coming before the board that relate, at least in part, to changes in the organization of, of particular industries. One that might be of particular interest to this audience is the higher education industry. Um, and in, uh, in Pacific Lutheran University, again, uh, issued last year, the board addressed both the um, the yeshiva issue in the context of of developments that have been taking place in in higher education over um, over the last couple of decades, and also the the Catholic bishop issue. One other category in which um, in which the the board has um, I think spent some significant time over the last several years is in the area I think what I would describe as cleaning up our own house the the biggest um, I think the biggest event at least in terms of um, the amount of time um, and effort that it took was the the revision of the our case procedures and um, there were many changes that, that's already been discussed um, many long overdue changes just to make the process more more efficient the other area um, would be the the line of cases starting with specialty health care um, that was an area in which, despite the long-standing principle that all that's needed for an election to be directed is an appropriate unit, not the most appropriate unit, but any appropriate unit, there had been this thicket of, of, um, of law that had that had grown up around around that question, and um, so you have specialty health care, then the the department store matching set of Macy's and and Bergdorf Goodman, and um, I'm hopeful that that will go a long way to making the um, the litigation in that area as at least closer to as um, simple as it was intended to be under the statute. So let me leave it at that. I'm sure you want to hear about all the interesting issues that are currently pending before the board and, and we want to leave time for questions as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kent. Thank, thank you very much. That's, that's quite a list of, of very important cases and, and issues that the board's been dealing with. Um, we have some pending issues before the board that will be addressed by uh, 
uh, member uh, Harry Johnson, who was a partner with Aaron Fox before coming to the Labor Board. Uh, prior to that, he worked for a number of years with the Jones Day firm, uh, where he was a partner. Uh, was uh, recognized by the Daily Journal as one of the top labor and employment attorneys in California, um, and is uh, has a background uh, from Johns Hopkins, Tufts, and Harvard Law School. Uh, he's been a dissenter in a number of cases. Uh, uh, if, if time permits, he might want to say something in dissent to one case, but maybe it ought to be just all future cases. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before I uh, get into sort of the pre-planned topic, I would, of course, like to thank everybody here. I'd like to thank Professor Shaner and Dean Shapiro and Emory Law School and, of course, Han Solo's favorite law firm, Ford and Harrison, um, for generously sponsoring this. Um, it, it is a great honor and privilege to be a member of this public body. It is not something uh, that I feel like I was entitled to in any way. Uh, or was due for any particular expertise or case or showing that I made in my earlier career. So when I wake up in the morning, I walk into work and think, you have to earn this uh, every day. Um, I think that the statute is of vital importance to the United States, uh, as, do every, as do probably everybody else in this room. I'd like to focus on what uh, Chairman Gould had mentioned in his talk, and this I, this had completely gone by me, but, you know, it is the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, mm -hmm. which was the first delineation of the idea that, in, in my view, you have rights that counterbalance power, and you have responsibility that counterbalances rights, and this is the where we all started trying to sort these things out. And 800 years later, sort of the promise of some industrial democracy is shown in the National Labor Relations Act, and the reason why I think it is of vital importance is I believe very strongly in the free enterprise system. I believe very strongly that that is the best and brightest path to ensuring the greatest you know, moral and material happiness for the largest amount of people. The one issue, though, in modern capitalism, there's no operating code in there, sort of moral operating code that guarantees that an employer is not going to treat employees badly. The National Labor Relations Act at least provides a process for those employees to become involved in discussing their own terms and conditions of employment, and I think that um, that is a very good thing because at the end of the day, we don't want to wake up and live in a United States of America that looks a lot like late-stage imperial Rome where you have a bunch of oligarchic plutocrats on the one hand and serfs on the other hand, and that's it because at that point, nobody has any stake in society and we're not America anymore. So I do think the National Labor Relations Act is an inherent part of the national fabric, especially at this point. Um, and I do love the institution. It is a bit of a tough love, as is shown in some of my dissents, which I'll get into, because although the titular uh, topic that I have is pending issues, you can't talk about pending issues without dovetailing to what Ken just talked about, which are cases that have been decided, because, of course, cases that have been decided, not all parts of them have been decided. So they're coming <coughs> back to us. And in fact, some of the Noel Canning cases we have to, in effect, re-decide with a new group of people. So I, this is going to be a little bit of a running commentary that is uh, interspliced in with some pending issues. I, just as Ken pointed out, although the statute's been around for 80 years, there are a lot of basic questions that we still wrestle with all the time. And two of the pending issues that we have, one is who's an employee, and the other is who's an employer. So I'll start with who's an employee first. FedEx Home Delivery, as Kent mentioned, um, sort of resolved that distinction between an independent contractor and an employee. And the reason why this is all important is, of course, the modern workplace is no different than the workplace back in 1935 in the sense that there are a group of people who are producing the goods and services, which we call employees, which are regulated by our act. And then there are all these different subdivisions of other people, some of whom work like independent contractors who are not covered by the act, supervisors who supervise that group of workers who are not covered by the act. 
back. And these distinctions have come about and been crafted over many years, and, and they serve the policy purposes behind the act. And you would think that we would have resolved all of this. But the National Labor Relations Act is infinitely flexible and adaptable given the way the economy is changing. One of our big challenges, of course, is if you all um, travel around a lot, many of you probably use Uber. Uber is one example of what we, I would just say is the task-based economy. I mean, we have an economy where you have a technically an entity, you can call it the employer or the contractor or whatnot, that engages hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, essentially on a piecework basis to do some task, and then they're done. And one of the challenges of the act is going to have to resolve that is a pending issue, although I couldn't cite a case right now, is going to be how the National Labor Relations Act adapts its casual employee um, doctrines, how it adapts its employee doctrines, how it adapts its independent contractor doctrines to that pending development in the economy. Um, so we have that. But the, the case that most people have on their mind, especially in the uh, college and university environment, is Northwestern University, which the immediate question is, uh, are grant and aid scholarship student recipients known as student athletes, known as uh, students who play football and who are on a football scholarship, um, however you want to call them, are they employees under the Act? Um, that case is actively pending in front of us. There are more than 20 amicus briefs that have been filed. And just um, to touch on something that Professor Gardner mentioned, you know, I do think in the representation case procedure, since I had to live through it, a rulemaking is much better of a vehicle to solve a massive, as she sort of described, a comprehensive suite of changes to a large set of regulations, because you couldn't really do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and it, I'm not really sure how far rulemaking extends into where you have very discrete and specific issues, even if they're of general application, once we get into student athletes in particular. But one thing that I would encourage you all to consider, uh, to encourage the board to consider, is the increased use of oral argument for pending issues. Uh, because, in fact, I think that, uh, and Kent deserves 99 percent of the credit for this, organizing the discussion, the notice and comment period, as it was for the rulemaking um, that we just, where we just issued the final rule, uh, I think was a s great stroke of uh, connecting the public and real live human beings with what we were trying to do. And many of them, in my view, offered very valuable perspectives. And so the, um, at the end of the day, I have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so the pending issues will, will be curtailed. But in... <laughs> The, the other side of the coin is this Browning-Ferris case that Kent mentioned, which is, of course, our joint employer case, which we have many, um, many pleadings and filings. In fact, the McDonald's version of this, because we had to look at, or I had to look at something in that file on Friday, last Friday, I believe. Um, it, there are over a thousand pleadings in that case already. Now, some of them are pretty, you know, mild stuff, such as notice of appearance. I am now appearing on behalf of certain franchisee. But there are there are a lot of motions uh, of some heft in there, and we're going to have to decide all that, and that is going to pose a challenge um, at, in terms of many pending issues that spool out of this overarching pending issue, which is who is an employer and. The, the fact is, is that there, the, there have been doctrines, and they have been somewhat malleable, and they have shifted somewhat in terms of what the test is for who is, besides the technical and obvious employer, who might be another employer. And how does that interact with our policy of collective bargaining? Because as the, several of the prior speakers mentioned, we're supposed to promote collective bargaining. Um, and the question then becomes what sort of definition of employer is going to actually do that? I mean, how far, in other words, can you socialize bargaining among all these different entities that have some sort of impact on the technical employing entity before bargaining loses its force or purpose? Or is there really a limit at all? So there's a lot of very interesting foundational stuff that is worked into that question. 
Um, so we, we have those two basic questions, which are pending issues. We have a lot of other pending issues that spool out of some issues that have been decided. I'll give you two other relatively obvious and, and pressing examples. Um, for example, um, it was discussed, uh, the D.R. Horton case and the Murphy Oil case were discussed. And there are many uh, subsets of arbitration agreement issues, like how we're going to deal with opt-outs, how we're going to deal with, um, for example, arbitration agreements that have a specific carve-out, not just for National Labor Relations Act charges, but for the whole National Labor Relations Act process that basically says that the, the agreement is not intended to interfere with that process. Now, just in case you're wondering what I think of D.R. Horton and Murphy Oil, <laughs> um, there have been a number of commentators that have said it's the great decision or the best decision we've ever made. Well, if you take great and best and replace that with worst, that would probably be my view, unfortunately, because <laughs> I was in the dissent on that case, and you can read it. It's like a 45-page dissent. I think we had some severe problems harmonizing the National Labor Relations Act with the Federal Arbitration Act, the Rules Enabling Act, Section 216B of the Fair Labor Standards Act, several other acts, which I won't get into now, and some other issues. But since I only have 60 seconds, I'm not going to cover <laughs> the 45 pages of that dissent. I, what I will do is uh, just get to our last pending issue, and this is pending in, in a number of cases. It's sort of the follow-on to Purple Communications, because there are many other electronic communication networks than email, and Purple Communications is essentially a case about email, and it says in there it's about, about nothing else. So we have a lot of cases where employers have electronic resources policies of one kind or another, or social media communications policies of one kind or another. And the employers basically say, we're going to try and regulate what you can say as an employee on those networks. As we all know, it's a very electronically wired society. So this is of vital importance to the modern worker in the modern workplace. All of those different variants of, of uh, cases and, and technological systems are coming to us. There are some that are pending before us. There are some that are obviously going to be pending in the next four or five years. And I think that that is uh, the electronic frontier is going to be a very fertile frontier in terms of the development of modern American labor law. And I'm happy to have played my small part in that. And thank you for allowing me to be here. This has been a really remarkable panel, open, candid, thorough, uh, circumspect, and divergent, uh, sometimes in views. Um, we have kept pretty close to our schedule. I've been the time Nazi, but we really would like to have a few questions at least uh, before we break for lunch. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, but we started a little bit behind. So if anyone has a question, please go to the microphone and uh, uh, we'll take you in order of uh, grabbing the mic. Proceed. Uh, yeah, so it's really a question for the whole board, but something specific to uh, what Member McFerrin uh, stated. And she commended the board for, while not always agreeing on the interpretation, they do agree on the end goal. Um, and I guess my question is, how much of that goal is shaped by Washington and the administrated, uh, administration of the time? Well, uh, I have to say that the the one pleasure I have serving as as chairman of of this uh, august board is that they all have extreme integ integrity. I have the advantage of of chairing a board that has uh, <clears throat> subject matter expertise, and uh, in 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 that respect, when we discuss and debate debate the issues. Our perspectives come come from viewpoints rel that lie within the nature of the of the labor management relationship, and little has to do with the w with the political climate. Um, we might talk about political climate with respect to what might happen when it gets into the courts, but uh, that does not affect our decision. Our decisions are are are. are law-based. Um, the, the divergent viewpoints create a situation where um, the majority has to have its act together because it, it, it it's, has to respond to very 
uh, very good arguments on the dissent side. The dissents have to be v void of intellectual dishonesty because the majority is going to call them on that. So, and, and to the credit of my colleagues, we don't have to waste a lot of time with that. Now, I just want to concur that um, uh, once I commenced serving on the board after having been in private practice for many years, essentially everyone stopped talking to me. And, uh, it, uh, you know, the, the frame of reference that we have, and it's not just the board members, we all have chief counsel, deputy chief counsel, staff attorneys uh, who are extremely talented, almost all of whom have had long careers within the agency. And the focus in terms of our own decision making, notwithstanding the fact that we work inside the beltway, is on the statute that Congress gave us in 1935 and amended in 1947 and 1959 and 1974. And, uh, you know, that's really the framework that, that governs our decision making. And, you know, and that many of the decisions that we render, uh, you know, people often talk about the majority and the dissent like that's kind of a unitary term, but we have many unanimous decisions. We have many decisions in which the Republican members, uh, I think, that are popularly associated with, you know, trying to save employers actually um, unanimously find employer violations. We have uh, Democratic members that find violations that relate to unions. and. Um, that aspect of the board is not as publicly visible, but it, it, it gives some confidence that our process is one that is, I think, involves high, a high degree of integrity within the agency. And if I could supplement it, even though it wasn't addressed to the general counsel, one thing you got to remember is there were 24,000 charges filed last year. Of the 24, actually 24,015 charges filed last year, of, of those charges, 60 about 64 percent, no merit was found, and that was a decision made at the regions, and they were either dismissed or withdrawn. Of the 34 percent or so charges where there was merit found, 93.4 percent of those cases were settled at the regional level. So um, the stuff that is the work of the agency that comes to be decided by the board is very much the tip of the iceberg. And so the vast majority of things are pretty straightforward, routine, well-established uh, matters, and the vast, vast, vast majority of merit determinations are settled. And if I could jump in on top of everybody else, um, we are an independent agency. We have tried to act as an independent agency um, from the board members and the general counsel on down. As far as I can tell, we're trying. I mean, there are obviously vast philosophical differences among the people who are up here, and that does express itself uh, from time to time in dissent. If you broke down all the cases into all their subcomponent issues, though, you would probably find that somewhere between 60 and 80% of the votes on issues would be unanimous. The stuff that gets the press, though, is obviously when we ha when our deep philosophical differences, a case happens to hit that fault line. And so then that's what you see uh, in that case. The problem with us being an independent agency, though, is we are our own bosses. And so in effect, we are not like we should never start acting like a law review that has no deadlines. We have to, we can write whatever we want for example, but we have no deadline to get it out because these are real cases involving real people who have real problems that we're supposed to resolve. And so the big, well, another big challenge for us is just simply getting through the cases and getting them out in the most effective way possible. Well, I think I'm going to have to call time on the, uh, on the program because it, it's time for lunch break. Uh, ben, do you want to make any announcements about anything or tell people what the deal is?